I'm very glad to introduce uh, Jacob Barka. Ma. Jacob Barka. Um, Jacob has a background in engineering and uh, computer science and disease modeling. Uh, his topic is the reference model for disease propagation and myths to find data fitness. So we'll find out what that's about. Uh, he's educated at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology and his acquired experience in manufacturing and healthcare modeling from University of Michigan. Uh, he's currently a freelancer um, and he pursues his uh, development um, effort in this MIST system. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a few flyers out here. If anyone is interested, I'll pass them around. Just pick one if, um, if you need them. And I'll hand it over. Thanks. OK, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. One of them is the reference model. The other one is MIST. MIST stands for Micro Simulation Tool. Uh, and the reference model is a model for disease progression. Um, probably not many people here know many things about disease models. So what are those? Disease models try to describe phenomena that you find in clinical trials. In a sense, those are an those are typically equations, risk equations, uh, that give you the probability of having a heart attack or having a stroke or whatever phenomena you are looking at. Um, when you have such an equation, you can try to predict the future, what might happen to a certain population or a certain person. This is the idea behind it. But those are equations that describe this phenomena. Uh, many times they are used to find out how much it will cost the system uh, or uh, what will be the quality of life of a population uh, if they have a certain uh, condition, medical condition. However, those disease uh, models are, um, are de derived from a certain population. Usually there is a big set of the data uh, upon which uh, some analysis is made and those equations are derived. Those describe the phenomena seen in that cl uh, clinical trial or in that data set. They may not uh, always fit other populations. Today there is an effort to uh, generalize this and extend this to work on other uh, populations and the reference model is one of these attempts. There are other types of attempts all around for the world. So uh, this is the current version of the reference model. Uh, it's still very simple. Uh, currently, it's aimed at diabetic populations. Uh, however, it can be extended. Uh, you can see here three disease processes. Heart attack is the first uh, one. The second one is stroke. The third one is competing mortality because people can get, die out of get, getting hit by a bus and not necessarily by uh, dying out of disease. Um, uh, the reference model is called the reference model because it's based on references to the literature. The information there is generally public, uh, not proprietary not restricted. There is no access to real uh, individual data. It's all summary data that exists somewhere. But actually, there is much more summary data than uh, individual data. Think about it. If you have a data set, uh, a certain population uh, that you have access to, you're not allowed to combine it with other data set. You're not allowed to give it to some uh, other people. However, when you publish information from a clinical trial, you put it publicly. Everyone can access it. And there are many, many of those. So you can derive information from this this way. Um, the reference model also is, and this is maybe the most important thing here, is a league of models. It's not one model. It takes many, many risk equations and just makes them compete against each other, trying to fit whatever was seen in past clinical trials. And it shows uh, and gives you the ability to run it against multiple, uh, uh, multiple populations. So how does it work, basically? So in the reference model, you take a population. Uh, this population, uh, you find it as summary data. The system expands it to mock individuals, many, many, many individuals to, uh, that are extracted from this uh, data that is known. And this population is run through the model. Now, each model, uh, each transition in the model it can be a different risk equation taken from a different source. Here I'm showing four MIs and four, uh, four strokes can be possible. 
Uh, but let's say first time the system runs with popula a certain population, it runs them and sees how many people have an MI, how many people have a stroke after a certain amount of years, and compares those results to the actual results observed in the same clinical trial that uh, population one belongs to. Uh, and then you can write down the difference. Here, for example, the difference was four, and uh, you can... Uh, you can change this metric if you really want to. You have some control over it. Then the system does the same for equation number two, equation number three for an MI, equation number four for an MI, and so on and so forth. It will do it for stroke as well, and you can add hypotheses on top of it because some things you don't necessarily know, and some of the equations um, may need some correction. You can add those corrections as hypotheses. Uh, basically, you can conduct kind of a virtual trial on top of uh, the information that's out there already. Then, after it's done for one population, we replace it for a different clinical trial. Again, we have all the data available in the publication. We run it through the system, and we get a different set of results. And color coding the results shows you very quickly what models are better, uh, when, where does information fit, where does it not fit? Not always does it fit uh, between pieces of information. So this color matrix are called uh, the fitness matrix. Uh, basically, it's a big error matrix. Uh, I'm going to leave now the reference model for a minute, and I'm going to talk about MIST, the micro-simulation tool. Micro-simulation tool is free software that was developed uh, to run uh, simulations, Monte Carlo simulations such as this. It has its own language, it, its own graphical user interface. Um, it's built on Python uh, with all sorts of nice libraries there. Uh, um, but in a nutshell, it's a Monte Carlo simulation compiler. Um, it's also, and this is fairly recent, only in the last few months, it's now also a population generator. Not only it can run those Monte Carlo simulations, it can generate populations uh, out of, to match statistics that you find in the literature. And also MIST, MIST runs over the cloud. I want you to remember this catchy phrase. Uh, maybe you'll be able to uh, look it up later on. So, it uses quite some computing power. This is an eight-core machine that I had that, after about two years of use, got fried. This is a real picture from a few weeks ago. But MIST can also run over the cloud, uh, the Amazon uh, EC2 cloud. Um, to run over the cloud, if someone is interested, the technical people in uh, how it is done, it uses um, software called uh, Star Cluster. Star cluster creates uh, um, a virtual cluster or on the Amazon cloud, a cloud. It does this from the command line very, very easily. Um, and uh, star, this, this cluster will run SunGrid engine. So basically, if you have uh, any software that runs on SunGrid engine, you can use star cluster to run it over the cloud. You can define your own computers that uh, you want to use it for. And, um, you can also uh, 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 use uh, uh, which kind of uh, image you want to use. Um, I use an Anaconda AMI to run it. So um, Anaconda not only uh, offers a distribution, you can also find an uh, Amazon machine image that you can run. And I use it to run a mist over the cloud. And to, remain with, to help you remain, remember the sketchy phrase, then mist does run over the cloud. But really, it does. Um, there's some, uh, if you download MIST from GitHub, you'll be able to uh, find some sample code that uh, shows you how to do this. Uh, but more importantly, and I will focus about it for a few minutes uh, before I'm going to go back to the reference model, uh, MIST now has the ability to generate populations from the statistics that are, um, that are seen, uh, that are seen in, uh, publications of clinical trials. So, um, Today, there was a talk before by Alex, he's sitting here. Uh, they have access to individual data, electronic medical records. I don't have access to individual data, and I actually don't want it. 
because once you have this access, you're kind of constrained. It's like a, a stone that you have to carry around. You, you're constrained by all sorts of laws. Uh, there are many, many, uh, there are many, many instances of public data that are out there, each clinical trial publication. And typically, in a clinical trial publication, you'll find table one. Table one will describe the, your statistics of, uh, your, the, st uh, the statistics of your population. This is an example I, uh, uh, I extracted from uh, a publication, uh, a large diabetic, st diabetes study that's held in the UK. It's called UKPDS. They have many publications. This is from number 33. Uh, you can see the table here has the, the age, the approximate age of the, of the cohorts, uh, mean and standard deviation, how many men, how many women, uh, how many of them were smoking, blood pressure, cholesterol. There are many more characteristics. I just uh, uh, put up a few just so you can understand how a table one looks like. Now, if I have this table one, I want to generate individuals that match this uh, statistics. Apparently, it's not that easy. Uh, for this, I'll need to use a library called Inspired, and I'm going to talk about Inspired quite a bit here. So basically, Inspired Mist allows me to generate the populations I need. I only need publicly available summary data, and I don't have to access any restricted data for, to do this. I'm much more mobile, and if you go to clinical, uh, clinical, clinicaltrials.gov today, you'll find many, many publications of clinical trials. So there's plenty of data out there that's available. Um, a, things, a few things about uh, Inspired. Um, this is Aaron Garrett. At least this is uh, his picture from his website. Um, we never met. He wrote Inspired, and I asked him about how to use the software, uh, how to use his library. In a day, basically, he supplied me with uh, uh, sufficient instructions and actually code that, does, uh, that solves most of the problem of po uh, population generation to a, to a target. What, is, what does Aspired do? It's a bio-inspired computational Python library. Um, I used genetic algorithms that are provided there, but it can do some other things as well. So, uh, I invite you to go and check out his library. I'm going to explain how MIST uses his library and how it interacts with it. So when I generate a population within MIST, uh, there are two things that I provide to generate population. Uh, population. First thing is generation expressions. Those are expressions within MIST domain-specific language that tell you how each individual will look like. Uh, what the age will be, what uh, uh, blood pressure, what characteristics at all I want this individual to have, and how they interact with each other. They can be correlated, they can be uncorrelated, independent. And uh, I can also add inclusion and exclusion criteria, mainly assertion statements within this. So this is how one individual looks like. However, even in clinical trials, this does not always represent well the entire population. So... For this, for the others, uh, uh, to represent well what happens in the, uh, in, in the actual uh, real world, you have to add objectives. Objectives define how the entire population statistics looks like. It can define uh, what you reached at the end. Um, basically, it defines table one that you find in the clinical trial. Um, it also, since we're talking Monte Carlo simulation, it also removes the random generation of uh, issue of, uh, that usually Monte Carlo has. So how does it work? So MIST itself has its expression compiler. It compiles uh, a Python script that runs Monte Carlo simulation that creates this population. This population matches those generation expressions. It may not match our statistics. Uh, Specifically, one example is when exclusion and exclusion criteria skew the population distribution. This happens a lot in clinical trials. Um, then objectives are added. And Inspired kicks in and selects a subset of that population that was generated that matches the objectives. So we know how we generated those, each one of those individuals and we also know that the subset was, that was selected is as close as possible to what we wanted in the objectives. 
what we define in their objectives. Um, how does Inspire do this? So MIST gives its instructions, but basically this is goes on. It's a genetic algorithm. If we have the set of candidates generated by MIST, Inspire generates subpopulations out of this initially. It has a way to generate uh, multiple functions. And uh, 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 sorry, uh, you, the user defines uh, the user in MIST defines what how to generate. Uh, MIS defines for uh, Inspire how to generate those functions. Um, uh, those subpopulation for functions. So I'm showing here this, that, uh, this, this is typically random. I'm showing some shapes here that will be recognizable because I'm going to show the next generation what happens. Um, the system now evaluates each one of those subpopulations. It gives it a score. The score is how close are those subpopulations to the objectives, to table one that we want to have at the end. Um, the best, meaning minimal error, are selected to be the next generation, parents for the next generation. And those parents are now used to create more uh, examples from that population using cross-over uh, uh, operators and mutation operators. Now we have a new generation. This generation goes back to uh, evaluation and then selection, variation, and so on and so forth. After many, many generations, the system stabilizes and MIST has, gives it a uh, uh, some criteria on how to terminate the, uh, the generation. And the best, uh, the best score, uh, best scoring subpopulation is used. This is the one that fits our objectives the best, uh, the best. Note again, it's not always possible to meet the objectives we wanted from the population we generated. But this is the most optimal thing that we can get within, uh, within reason. It's better probably than what happens in the real world. Um, so I'm going to give an example of, it, of why it's needed and how it is corrected. So why it's needed is the first example. We want to generate 10 people. This is without using Inspired. We want to generate 10 people with a certain inclusion criteria that they will be only ages 45 and up. Um, the base population distribution, meaning the population we're sampling from, is different for men and women, uh, different ages, different standard deviation, and we, we're sampling it from a population that's equal men and women. This is how Miss DSL looks like. You actually write those uh, expressions in, and uh, the assertion here actually removes those ages 45 and less. Um, this is what the system will generate for us. This is a simple example. However, if we look at what we got at the end, it does not fit what we started it, uh, from. The reason is the population got skewed because of our inclusion or exclusion criteria. And again, this happens in clinical trials a lot. Whenever they publish table one, you will see things like that. Uh, sometimes they actually say that this population is skewed in this parameter, uh, or this parameter is skewed this way. Sometimes they even use a different statistic to describe it. Um, however, how does Inspire correct it? Inspire allows you to define the objectives. Here, let's say we're using the same population as before, but now we're using totally different objectives. Uh, our mean is now 50 and 5, and we want to have more men than women for that reason or another. Let's say that this is how it went in the clinical trial. And went in the clinical trial, and uh, we can also add weights, saying what kind of uh, objective is more important than others. Now, generating we're generating 1,000 people and selecting only 10 out of those. And the system will find the best 10 that will match our table one. Now we have the mean, the standard deviation, and we can see that numbers much better, much, much better now. This is within the constraints. We could have generated more people. We could have added different weights. But what I'm trying to show you is now that we can remove this, uh, this issue of inclusion and exclusion criteria affecting whatever happens in table one at the end. 
I haven't tried it, but now I believe such technology can help uh, uh, in designing table one before you actually start recruiting, because you can now add all your assumptions together and try to model what might happen. Um, basically, that's the idea. Um, I'm going to jump ahead and remind you what I started talking about, the reference model for disease progression. The generation of population is, was such that we will have information to run models upon. This is how the fitness matrix, the output of the reference model, looks like. To remind you, the columns you see here, each one of them represents a different model. Actually, each one of those quadrants, the columns, are, uh, are a different model. Um, and the rows are different populations. The colors are based on the fitness in each one of the cells that do this. And you cannot see it, but if you, I'll zoom in even more, you'll see there's a number there. This is the fitness score. This means how well the model that we have fits the population results from that clinical trial. Um, the colors, you can see by the colors that sometimes information fits better, sometimes it, uh, it fits not, uh, not so well, uh, but it's all relative. The colors are relative. Um, I also add some, added some assumptions to the models. So I won't go into details. If you're interested later, I'll talk about the biomarker assumption. But uh, those are the left and right models separated by this line in the middle. Uh, I do want to talk, however, about the uh, date correction. Basically, it's temporal correction for, modeling, for models getting outdated. If a model is based on a population that was co uh, collected, the data collected for was in the 70s or the 80s, it may not apply today. There are 30 years of, uh, uh, of uh, medical progress in treatment, in uh, prevention. Even people don't behave the same. So the models may not apply the same way that they did in the past. But once you add some coefficient to correct for those, and those are fairly simple, apparently models start behaving better. Uh, how can you see this? You can see this visually by the fact that you have warmer colors on the top half, which doesn't have that correction, but you will see more green. The grass is greener on the bottom half of the, of the, of the diagram here. So this shows you the date correction, and I can show it in numbers, is quite effective to get better results uh, out of the same models. So just tweaking a model a little bit makes it fit the data better. This is how you can now put other hypotheses and test them. You can also do this at the population level. The lines I added uh, separate the populations to how those were generated. From the statistics, you don't know whether those, uh, uh, the populations, how each indivi the individuals, uh, uh, how the parameters for each individual uh, are correlated there. Correlations is something that is typically unpublished, and it's an issue. So in this case, I'm taking two extreme approaches. I'm saying this half, the top half in each one of those um, quadrants is, um, is, is totally uh, uncorrelated. The parameters of an individual are independent. Age is not related to blood pressure. On the bottom half, they are fully correlated. This means if the person is old, they also have blood pressure. They are in extreme risk to, be, uh, 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 to have uh, bad cholesterol levels, and so on and so forth. So you can also see how basically the range of behavior on the models on those two assumptions. And you can add more and more assumptions and study data that is out there already. And this is what the reference model is for. Basically crunching uh, the data that's out there already and already publicly available. You can also find out what the best model is. Here, this is the best model currently, the row over here. You can see it mostly green. And you can also find phenomena that we cannot understand. The stripes, the red stripes over here, you see four of them because there are several assumptions on models and uh, populations. But this is essentially the same population. 
we cannot explain with existing models what happens there. We, at this point in time, really don't know. Um, so at this point, I'll start wrapping up and saying that this technology is only generally at its infancy. Some of the ideas are still have to be accepted. But uh, it's already growing. For example, uh, next month, there'll be uh, the Mount Hood Challenge will be, taking, uh, will be, it will be here in Stanford, uh, 18 and 19, if the dates are correct. Um, so the reference model will be one of the participants with several other models there. Basically, there is where uh, diabetes modelers compare and contrast their models. But the same technology, there's no reason why it shouldn't be applied to other uh, chronic diseases. It will, it's not uh, compatible with, uh, with uh, infectious diseases, not spread diseases, but chronic diseases, this technology should fit. But the population generation uh, aspect that MIST provides, it, it's new and it's totally unexplored. Uh, so I already raised the hypothesis of maybe this is worthwhile to maybe uh, model a clinical trial population recruitment before actually starting uh, recruiting for the uh, clinical trial, just to see whether you are recruiting for populations that you can actually match your table one. That there would be uh, to plan your table one ahead. Haven't tried it. Uh, it could be interesting to see whether it's helpful or not. Uh, but think about it. This model's recruitment. What about modeling other types of recruitment efforts from population? Maybe it's helpful there. Uh, also, the, it's population modeling. We are now at, at Facebook headquarters. Uh, they deal with populations. Maybe there are some other applications there that uh, no one has thought of before, handling multiple populations. Um, I will stop now. I do want to acknowledge uh, many people that helped throughout uh, development. Uh, Diana Eisman, about the ACOs ago, she came up with the idea of uh, collecting all this information uh, that's available and making sense out of it. Uh, she was a statistician. Uh, uh, and she had her own method. Morton Brown and Bill Herman, they helped held this project enough time to help it mature to the point that it's now today. Aaron Garrett helped a lot with Inspired. Uh, I already mentioned this. Uh, the guys from Continuum Analytics, uh, Ben Zeitlin created AMI, uh, uh, Ilan Schnell uh, develops Anaconda, which is now the base platform uh, for developing MIST and the reference model. Uh, and there are many, many other, uh, uh, other people that uh, deserve acknowledgement, maybe those, uh, mainly those who develop a, a software and um, actually answer all those uh, posts on all the message boards out there. Uh, legacy, uh, legacy funding from the uh, NIH started this project. However, today it's independently developed and uh, funded without financial support. At this point, I will stop and open up for questions. I hope I left enough time for you to, answer, uh, uh, to ask questions, and there will be interest. So, Dr. Barhawk, let's say, um, so in the, in the first example, we have the, you know, they were giving um, a percentage smokers, percentage male, uh, age ranges, and, and so on, right? Um, but those are just the marginal um, um, statistics for, uh, for that. Um, so, um, is it, you, so, so how do you, if the, if the researcher didn't report the, the, Co, um, uh, co linearity of, of, of uh, smoking with sex or with, uh, or, you know, uh, how do you just kind of do your best and find, find whatever uh, gives the best, most similar margins? So the, this is exactly what I showed at the end. Uh, you don't know those things. So two things about knowing those things. If they are not published, no one knows them. How can you derive any useful information without, without knowing? And no one publishes those. So that's the first thing. 
So when you see table one, you think, oh, this is my population. This was what clinical trial was conducted on. You don't see all those inclusion. They, they are written in the report. They, they do stay, we had those <coughs> inclusion inclusion criteria. And sometimes they even say that they skewed the population. But you looking at table one may derive, even as a person looking at it, may not see the entire scope of your population. You don't see the correlations you're talking about. You don't see a lot of things. So this is the problem. I agree with you. The people who have access to this data do not release it publicly. But if they don't release it, how can anyone be learning from it? So under, this, some, under those conditions, I'm doing the best possible. I'm saying, you know what? Let's do the best we can from what we have. And there's a lot of them out there, a lot of publication out there. So uh, I'm going to go back to the slide. This slide. This line actually divides two hypotheses on the population generation. So it actually shows you. These are the people that are highly, fully correlated. This means if the person here, there is only one random number that I generate to generate the entire person. And this number will tell me if it's high, this will be an old person, which is probably smoking, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, all the risks possible is probably this person already dying if I generated a high number already. So this is fully correlated. This is totally independent, the second half here. And now, if you run the model, now you can see whether the results match over the fully correlated and the uh, totally independent group. So this gives you two extremes. If those match, then it gives you some information. But if those don't, then you know, oh, we have a problem here. Maybe something either on the data is different. Maybe we cannot explain it. So far, you didn't have this map. This is a map. So I'm trying to create this map from available data. I'm unrestricted by all sorts of uh, laws like you are. You have restrictions. On, you cannot move your data. It's like, it's, loads, it's like a stone that you cannot carry around. Uh, yes and no, because you cannot de-identify it and you do do this. But even the identify data, you can, there are restrictions on this. We know that. But this is summary data. This is totally unrestricted. This is a bunch of numbers somewhere that can present something else. So what I'm doing, I'm trying to make the best out of this. Um, does it give an answer? <laughs> Uh, sorry. Um, it, am, am I understanding it right? Um, so, so if, um, the difference between this and a um, pseudo-random number generator that creates a normal distribution, like like our uh, our norm in in the R language, for example, and I'm sure there's something like that in Python. Um, uh, the difference between those two is it true that uh, so so if I had an unrestricted population and, and this table one of marginal, um, of, of means and standard errors and, and of frequencies of various things, um, I could in principle like have a, have a binomial random number, pseudo random number generator uh, for, 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 for those quali uh, quantitative traits and a normal um, pseudo random number generator for things like age and weight, although Ages, this, yeah. this is the generation expressions. You are now describing generation expressions that I use to generate each individual. Okay, but but um, is it uh, is is the is kind of the take home message here that um, because in addition the cl the clinicians have said they have a selection criteria, there this is not coming from a normal distribution. This is coming from a segment of the normal distribution, and that's what you're adding. Because if, if they were saying we, we just we randomly picked a bunch of people from the population, that that uh, um, um, panel of random number generators would do just as good of a job as this. So you're saying that's the piece that this is adding is the that restriction criteria. Two things. First of all, it eliminates Monte Carlo generation error because whenever you generate something random, you have randomness. This eliminates it. Now, whatever eliminates it to the degree of how much computation power you throw with it, of course. But it, it does eliminate it. So this is the first thing. The second thing, after you've done this, uh, uh, 
it does allow you to explore how inclusion or exclusion criteria will affect whatever you have in the end. This is what I meant. You might use it to actually plan how table one looks like at the end. Today, I don't know, they, they start a clinical trial today. Ten years from now, things might be totally, they select a set of people. Some of them will quit the trial. Some of them will continue. But after 10 years, this is where you collect the data of how table one would look like at the end, correct? Can you actually plan it 10 years ahead? Depending on the data and depending on how much I trust my <coughs> distribution model, maybe yes, maybe no. But, but this is a tool that might help because now you can hypothesize. And later, 10 years later, you can see how, how good your, your hypotheses are. But this is a model, and models are for hypothesizing. And they show you how good the information will fit eventually. Uh, there was, I, I was just in ModSim recently. They, someone there said this famous saying about models. I don't remember the origin. They said that um, uh, all models are bad, some are useful. Yeah, um, uh, I don't know the origin, but... Um, hmm? Ronald Fisher, you're saying? Okay, maybe. So this is useful to show our understanding. This is a map of our understanding of what goes on. And currently, look at this in the colors. Do we understand everything? Not necessarily. Some populations we cannot explain. Sometimes some models work. When you actually run this, you can see some models work much better than others on some populations. But some models persist and become average Ever, uh, on average, we, uh, quite well. Um, uh, hi. Uh, I'm, I'm a hardware engineer myself. I design, I simulate transistors. I work at Apple. Um, so, uh, Part of my design, I want to know the robustness of my response uh, in the statistical domain. So usually when we design to three sigma, it's easy to run Monte Carlo, like 100 runs. Uh, usually dealing with, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's normally distributed, you just pick up one sigma, you multiply by three and you're good. But some of our distributions are not really normal. So and we are interested in uh, looking at high SEMA values or extreme values or uh, rare events. It depends on, you know, who you talk to, right? So let's say I design, a, you guys know that circuits now, they have billions of transistors, right? So uh, instead of me running one billion Monte Carlo, can I apply, do you see, uh, so this kind of missed, uh, tool, can I apply it to some of these extreme value theory or finding like a point, you know, in the six to seven sigma without me running billions of Monte Carlo? So, uh, depends, uh, it's, if you're looking about for population generation or for a model to run something, uh, I am not sure that this will be the best approach, but we can talk later to see whether there's some something that can be done here. Uh, MIST specifically is general enough to run multiple types of Monte Carlo simulation. Um, it's written in Python, uh, and it's free software, so you can test it and play with it and see whether it's what, you fit, uh, what fits you or not. And uh, um, you can download it through you know, the QR code on the left. You'll be, uh, will, will take you to the MIST uh, repository on GitHub. Um, but the, if you are looking for um, some subset of populations uh, and to way to optimize the population to look only at something specific, then maybe the ideas here that I used inspired for, maybe they'll be helpful for you. So you might want to check it out. Because basically what I do is I create a population, then I optimize only to a subset of it. But if you're talking about rare events, you have to still generate those rare events. Yeah, that's the point. So the question is, how do you generate the rare events if they are so rare? Yeah, my goal is to generate maybe a billion sample, which I'm not going to simulate, but I'm just going to simulate maybe the ones in the tails or ah, so you can like you this. can you can generate the entire population, then use uh, inspired to optimize to only the tail that you're interested in, and then run your simulations. From this okay. perspective, this is exactly what MIST is doing. Okay, sounds so, good. So, same idea. Hello. 
Uh, is there any, um, so a lot of this is because the raw data from clinical trials is not made public. And is there any push from researchers to actually make that data public from, um, from all these clinical trials? So there is a big push towards making a lot of this uh, information uh, public, and you should talk to Alex later because this is partially what they are doing. Uh, the idea is to de-identify some of the data and put it out so people can use it. Uh, but uh, even though, even if you de-identify some of the data sets, think about it, not everyone in the entire world will do this because if you're talking about globally, people, uh, the laws in the UK might not be the same in the US, and when they do some clinical trials that are involve more than one country, this becomes cumbersome. Uh, you can see this. Uh, uh, but a lot of people, uh, it, it's, it's difficult. This is an easy way to look at data that's already out there and maybe outdated some of it, but maybe it can be, be useful or not. And it's kind of a generic way because basically what you do is you take the paper, you read the paper, you plug in the data into table one, you plug in the results into some other place, then you plug in a bunch of models and see how all of this behaves together, uh, together using high performance computing, which is today relatively cheap. Why not try to do this in parallel to some other methods? Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Thank you very much.